to everybody that is watching us uh, online. Uh, I have to remind uh, that the event is transmitted live uh, on the Facebook page of the Order of Architects Bucharest. Wawi uh, Mun Housing Hub, uh, it's a program initiated by the University of Architecture and Urbanism Yong Minku Bucharest uh, through the Basics of Architectural Design Department in partnership with the Order of Architects Bucharest and is taking place in the frame of the Architectural Annual 2021. I will say a few words about the background of the event. Uh, it consists in the investigation of uh, contemporary housing strategies in the dense uh, urban context of the city, in particular, uh, particular in the city of Bucharest. Um, this is a teaching as well as a research uh, program taking place uh, each year in the architectural studios uh, dedicated to the second and third year students in our school. Um, these events are aiming to create a larger uh, framework, framework of debate and reflection uh, open to the professional community as well. Um, in this context, um, we are very honored to have with us today Professor uh, Jonathan Sergison. Uh, we thank him very much for agreeing to participate in our event um, and to give us a lecture on the topic that we propose, uh, meaning the housing, um, and to share us um, the experience uh, of his renowned practice office, uh, Sergison Bates Architects. Uh, as well as his important uh, teaching experience um, as a professor in major architectural sc schools in Europe. Uh, first, I want to, to thank um, the Order of Architects and uh, the President Emily Vanescu for supporting us uh, constantly and uh, unconditionally <laughs> during the entire process. Um, then uh, I want to thank to the rector of our university and the dean, Horia uh, Moldovan, that uh, is uh, with us today in the meeting. Um, and uh, a special thank to my colleagues in the, de in the department, uh, the basic of Arch architectural design department, and uh, especially to um, Vladimir Vina and uh, Andra Panait that uh, co-organized this um, this event. Uh, and the last part I don't want to forget, last but not least, uh, to uh, Christian Zaharia from uh, the Order of Architects that uh, ensure the technical support for the, the event today. Um, so I uh, will invite uh, now uh, Emily Vanescu if he wants to say a few words in the opening. Only thank you very much, and we are very honored to be together, uh, university and other of architects to work together. And uh, we are very honored to be with uh, Jonathan here, and uh, we are very anxious to, <laughs> to hear the conference and the debates. So thank you very much. Thank you, Emil. Um, now uh, I will um, uh, invite uh, Vladimir. Uh, uh, Vina to introduce our guest, but before, uh, first I want to add uh, uh, and to invite my colleagues that are present in the meeting to address questions at the end of the lecture uh, in, order to, in order to initiate a discussion if possible, and uh, so please um, uh, write me in the chat uh, in order to know, to introduce you at the end uh, of the uh, lecture to address questions. And also we uh, will uh, take over and read um, questions that are po posted uh, in the comments on the Facebook page. So uh, I uh, invite also uh, people that are watching to address us uh, questions uh, uh, on during the lecture or at the end, and we will read them uh, in, the, in the Zoom meeting. Uh, thank you. Vladimir? Well, uh, I hope you, you hear me. Yes. Uh, and yes, uh, I will be short, as I think Jonathan Sergison 
doesn't need much of a presentation. Uh, he's well known, important, and influential in contemporary architecture culture. Um, our British guest, educated at the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London, founded in the mid 90s, Sergison Bates Architects, together with Stephen Bates, his lifelong professional partner. Designing both residential and public buildings, Sergison Bates Architects is among those few and selected contemporary practices which are critically interrogating the quintessentially modern break between past and, pre and present, trying to find if maybe sometimes this break is narrower than we think. Sergison Bates is, I think, above everything, a profoundly humanist architectural practice. Um, let me read a very short quote from Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition. This is a citation taken from a Kenneth Frampton critical text from his history of modern architecture. The only indispensable material factor in the generation of power is the living together of people. Only when men live so close together that the possibilities of action are always present, can power remain with them. To be clear, this power is also a power to create. Jonathan Sergison's today lecture will be about architecture, about cities, about how to live closely together in a complicated and well, sometimes dangerous world. But this world and those cities and architectural wonders which populate them are also sometimes beautiful, dangerously beautiful. Our guest architecture is about the inherent dangers and potentialities of trying to live together in this world and also about the beauty which can be found there. It is about the beauty which is to be created there, here, and everywhere. This conscience that a true humanist and ethical position in architecture and urbanism can only lead to beauty permeates in various ways our guest's work. We are truly honored Let's welcome our guest lecturer. Vladimir, thank you so much for those exceptionally generous and kind words. Um, I feel with such an introduction, I have now a huge responsibility to give uh, um, a lecture that is uh, equal to the introduction I've just received. And also, Melania, thank you for your kind words of introduction, and indeed to Emil as well. Um, and Horia, I am delighted that you are able to join. Um, but I should also say thank you very much to the Jan Minkel School for hosting this event in collaboration with the Bucharest Order of Architects. Um, I was just recounting that the last time I was in Bucharest was in uh, 2013, um, uh, a time when I was working with my students at the Academia di Mendrisio uh, on a project in Bucharest, a very uh, fulfilling um, semester, as I recall. And if any of you students are interested on my studio's website, you could see the evidence of the work that we were doing in Bucharest. My only regret this afternoon is that I'm not with you in Bucharest, a city that for various reasons, including um, uh, family connections, I, I have a particular fondness uh, to. Um, as has already been stated, what I would like to address uh, in this lecture this afternoon is the relationship we find ourselves working with and in relation to, um, namely the European city. 
the European city for us is invariably the setting for our work. And I must say that first and foremost, I consider myself to be European. As a British person, that is a point that I would make strongly. But moving from this, I would also like to say, as indeed Vladimir has already stated, um, much of our work is in relation to the program of housing. And um, I would like to give particular emphasis to the relationship between the numerous cities that we find ourselves working in and particularly the way that we address housing as a building program. So at this point, what I'm gonna to attempt to do is um, open my lecture, yes, good, which is entitled 21 Not Always Connected Thoughts on Housing. And you can <laughs> get a measure of your own relationship to this lecture by counting from one to 21. But the first um, theme or issue that I would like to address is that when we consider housing, we should always understand it as a normative program and one that is the majority of the building stock of any city. Typically, 70% of the ground surface of any city is made up of housing um, as a building program. And when we look at an image like the one that you can see on the screen, uh, this is a slightly aerial photograph of Mexico City. Um, the scale and the, the grain of the city is, is frankly uh, astonishing. And while housing is a dominant building program, the largest area of the city is also made up of what one could understand as suburban uh, forms of housing. The second theme that I would like to address is the question of the house in the European city. This is a house. I mean, I think if one translates the word house in German into English, it is a more open uh, uh, definition of what the word might mean. These are houses. There's a sense of an urban composition that comes from the collective agreements that went into the making of this terrace street. And many of the decisions that are the work of previous generations organizing housing occur in informal and in ad hoc ways. And there's a certain wonder that can be associated with these actions. The third point I would like to make is that when we think of cities, we must always understand them as beholden of a huge economic condition, that the world cities that um, have been the result of speculation and huge building in the past, such as New York, that you can see in these images are a condition of um, uh, uh, an extremely important um, set of economic uh, drives and circumstances. I think one could also include Paris, which is the image that you can see here within that um, notion of world city. The fourth theme is permanence. In the act of building, there is a sense of an implied life that any act of building should fulfill. But what I find myself observing is that 
um, the conditions of the European city are often an encounter with buildings that have substantially outlived um, the, the life that they might have had projected um, to them when they were first enacted. And now an image of our work, um, a housing project in North London, where rather consciously we said to ourselves that in the work that is fulfilling a housing program, we were committed to making a house or these houses feel permanent and lasting. And through the choices that we made in their construction, this is enforced. I would add that this is not a representative image of the conditions of this particular project. There was a festival in a park um, that adjoins the site of this project. At the moment, this photograph was taken. What is representative is the leaden London sky. The fifth theme is more and less density. In the case of many European cities, the management of density is one of the key tasks that we face as urbanists and architects. But there are also conditions that exist in the European city that for one reason or another, a sense of de-densification becomes also an urban opportunity. But in the case of London, this is not the case. Uh, London is a city of something like 9 million people. And as was already stated, Stephen Bates and I established our office in London in 1996. In 1997, um, the Labour government was elected in the, uh, um, as the government of the country. And one of the first acts of this uh, Labour government from 1997 was to create the position of a mayor of London. And I'm sure to all of you, you must be asking, but how could London not have a mayor before 1997? Well, it was because that role was abolished. And the arrival of the mayor of London resulted rather quickly in the appointment of Richard Rogers um, as the head of a department of urbanism and architecture. And Richard Rogers surrounded himself with a younger generation of architects who were my age at the time. And we found ourselves as a very young practice being invited to undertake large urban studies uh, for the future development of London. And from our point of view, this was the most extraordinary uh, opportunity to understand the role that we could play in the shaping and um, future planning of London at a um, large urban scale. And within this, this same theme of more and less density, I think of all of those other European cities that are familiar to me, uh, such as the one that lies only 50 kilometers where, from where I'm giving this lecture this afternoon, the city of Milan. And in other moments in our work, there have been occasion where we have worked at a much larger urban scale, such as here in the city of Geneva in Switzerland, where um, Geneva is a city that is facing a great deal of pressure to uh, grow and densify in the coming years. And I should add that in Swiss terms, it is already the densest city in the country. But a lot of my work um, through our studio um, in Zurich, which we opened in 2010, um, the place that I find myself living in and um, my teaching activities at the Academia in Mendrisio, we have uh, been focusing our attention on how the largest city in Switzerland can uh, accommodate a growing population uh, projected to be an increase of something like 20 or 25 percent um, in the next 20 or so years. 
And unlike in London, where things feel like a constant condition of chaos and improvisation, in Zurich, a very different set of circumstances seem to be played out where every decision is subjected to a rigorous and thorough uh, discussion and a very um, open democratic process. And the city recognizes that it is, it doesn't solve its future problems only by um, providing more homes. The quality and the amenity of the city is dependent on um, not only the, the housing uh, needs being fulfilled, but also additional educational facilities being um, built, um, other forms of amenity and leisure also being achieved, and uh, no sense of compromise in terms of um, uh, nature and uh, the, the natural offer that the city might um, provide for. So this plan for 2040 is very much the, the basis for the work that I've been doing with my students in Mendrisio over six semesters and um, working with the chair of the history and theory of urbanism at ETH in Zurich, um, my friend and colleague Tom Avamate, we have recently secured a um, Swiss National Fund uh, project to uh, undertake a research project for four years, which builds upon uh, my work that comes out of the studies that my students have been doing in Mendrisio. And this work also involves um, Irina Davidovich, who, as her name must imply to you, is also Romanian. So each semester with my students, we are looking at one of six areas of the city. And the insistence that I make in this um, future planning is that it is led by um, design proposals and projects. And here drawings which um, pull together the uh, studies that my students have been making for sites that are, are identified and recognized by the city as places for a program of densification. And one of the most wonderful rooms in Zurich is a, a room that has the city model, a model made at a scale of one to a thousand. And with all of the resource of, of my uh, energetic students, we have recreated at the same scale this model in Mendrisio. Um, uh, <laughs> I did a calculation at some point of how many thousands of uh, uh, people hour of work um, uh, this uh, six semester uh, study has uh, yielded. But here you can see in a part of this overall model, um, the, the students' work and their propositions. And it always interests me as an architect and an urban thinker how change occurs. And this um, rather innocent uh, series of photographs documents a, a, a suburban area of, of Zurich um, and how transformation is brought about. And in the image that you can see on the top, if you look very carefully, you might see. Um, poles sticking in the ground. And in the Swiss planning system, um, these are called Bauprofilen, which is a way of indicating to everybody what the profile of the future buildings will be. It's a, one of the ways of allowing uh, the populace to understand how transformation is being discussed. So not all, of, not all of the themes are so short. Um, the next one, which is also for me a very important theme is housing as types. And the German photographers, Benton Hillebecher made a, a lifelong study of buildings as types. Here, the documenting of German timber framed houses or um, uh, tile clad housing that they um, photographed and documented uh, through uh, very, a very meticulous and rigorous process of documentation. 
And as someone who grew up in London and has spent most of his life living in London, my relationship to urbanism is firstly one of a relationship to arguably English architects greatest greatest invention, which is the terraced house. And of course, I should caveat that by saying that it is not even an English invention because it is an interpretation, in fact, of an older uh, Dutch housing uh, solution that you would see in cities like Amsterdam or Harlem. But the thing that I enjoy so much about the London terraced house is the way that it works with a concept which is about uh, seemingly repetition, but closer examination reveals that there are subtleties and differences between one house and another, but it can result in the building of a city made up of terraces, occasionally squares, and even more occasionally crescents or circles. And in our practice, the terraced house has been a housing typology that we've explored um, on a number of occasions. Here, a project that we completed in, I think around 2004 um, in the East End of London, what we call a, a studio house, which anticipates certainly um, on the site to the left, um, this uh, building type being uh, developed as uh, a neighboring condition. Or an earlier project where we had the task of finishing a Victorian Georgian style um, London, terrace, uh, London Terrace. And the thing about the London terraced house is that it was, it's always been happier where it's dealing with the house in the middle of the terrace. It was never very successful at an inventing a solution for the ends. So here the requirement of this task was to consider that, that uh, such role. And returning to the previous example, the blank uh, party wall anticipates um, a future that has subsequently been enacted by building on that site. But the problem with the London terraced house is that it doesn't result in a dense city. So um, at the end of the 19th century, what is essentially a continental European model for housing, um, horizontal living or apartment living, um, resulted in the emergence of what in English we call the mansion block. And here a really wonderful example of this housing, which is very clever with the management of the plan, which is invariably very deep. And in some cases with the section um, exemplified here by uh, Richard Norman Shaw's housing, uh, the Albert Hall mansions in West London. And a project that our London studio is um, executing and uh, a project nearing completion is this interpretation of the mansion block as a housing type. Another type that we find ourselves looking at is the urban villa, which can be understood to be the type explored here in a Viennese housing project that we um, realized several years ago, working with um, the Viennese architect Werner Noeth and the Zurich office of Van Barmos Krucke. Or a project um, illustrated here in, in Brussels that we are um, currently building. Or Another project, which is at an earlier point of evolution um, here in, in North London, um, undertaken in collaboration with Stephen Taylor Architects and Allies and Morrison. And when I think of the suburban condition in England, I think of this housing solution. Um, something like three million of these houses were built in the period of the 1920s and 1930s in the United Kingdom. The semi-detached house or double house. 
And a competition that our studio won in um, 1998, I think, um, invited us to reconsider this older housing type. And as you can see in this image, what we're interested in is um, giving these two houses a sense of their doubleness and that the facade of these houses looks almost like a child's drawing of what a house should look like. Or a more recent interpretation of a double house, but very much with a continuing interest in the houseness of a house. Uh, the, this series of double houses that we built in the south of England, where in this instance, the party wall is um, cranked. And since 2012, I've lived in Zurich and found a relationship um, in the first instance to um, the urban villa, which I mentioned already as a wonderful urbanizing solution. Um, another example would be the project that I showed earlier for this social housing project in North London. But the other aspect of the European city that holds a huge fascination for me is these uh, parts of the city fabric that um, were achieved through the building of the perimeter block and inner courtyard as a solution for urbanizing Zurich, like many uh, Central European cities. But in the case of Zurich, um, often in the past, the center of these blocks be, were um, considered as places for employment uses. So you have smaller, house, um, smaller buildings in the center of blocks. This is quite different to say the, the Berlin version of the perimeter block or Mitzkazernen. Mit, mit and you can also find in, in Zurich uh, more recent interpretations of this same housing solution. In our work, a project that I will show at the end of the lecture in a little bit more detail um, is this um, component of the creation of a new um, urban block in, um, in Antwerp, uh, a wonderful site that lies on the harbour. And rehearsing um, the, the housing solutions or typological possibilities, inevitably there is a relationship to the great 19th century uh, housing solution, the multi-story um, uh, building or tower. And <laughs> this is a rather small tower, um, uh, a project that we finished um, in around about 2003 or 2004 in West London. And from the time when that project was finished, as part of the same building complex on a site that we didn't even at the time consider uh, proposing any building at all. We are now currently working on this pencil tower for the same client um, nearly 20 years later. It says a lot about this question of um, uh, the pressure on density, certainly in a city like London. And then there are other housing solutions that hold a certain fascination, the legacy of modernism that um, many European cities are dealing with. And uh, here again, a more recent um, interesting example of housing, um, a mixed uh, development program of Kalkleiter in, in Zurich, very near our Zurich studio. The seventh theme is certainly um, a very important one, one that in itself should be a lecture, but the question of what do we mean when we talk about sustainability? In many of our early projects, we turned to forms of construction that gave priority to timber-based um, 
constructions. This was possible because of the scale of our earlier projects, but there was also an interest in questions of prefabrication and uh, other environmental considerations like how to make um, breathing wall construction. Another aspect, aspect of our own engagement with this subject of, uh, of sustainability is a question of how, in the first instance, we must always question whether a building should be demolished before another one should be built in its place. And here in the same project in West London, the possibility of um, repurposing this former factory um, and um, continuing its employment uses, but also adding an additional floor of housing and the same uh, short tower at the end of this um, collection of, of additions and transformations. And always this questioning of what things are made from and where those materials come from. But I think there's also an argument that can be made in relation to this, that a building that is robustly detailed and with made of durable materials can have a very long life. And so in the case of this project that I've shown already on a number of occasions, the decision to make it out of an English brick that is locally sourced and the robustness that is evident in, in this image allows for a, a sense that this building will, in relation to the theme of permanence, equate to this. The eighth theme is old and new. I always look with a, a certain fascination at this ever evolving process of adding to and adjusting the European city. And sometimes there are juxtapositions which are really um, extraordinary. In around about 2004, we won a competition in collaboration with a Geneva architect, Jean-Paul Jacot, to build um, a, a mainly housing project in the city of Geneva. And this led to a relationship to this city, which I must say is, 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 is ongoing. But the, this photograph that Stephen Bates took of Geneva reminds me of the responsibility of building in the European city, the sense in which the buildings that you can see in this image were built in different times. And each one seems like it adds to the fabric of the city in a way that is contemporary, but also respectful of what preceded it. And the project that we realized in Geneva, you can see um, uh, the shorter facade of this corner building, which on the ground floor accommodates or the ground and first and second floor, a creche for the children of the neighborhood. And um, the upper floors contain um, a residential program. But the building has a neighbor on one side, which is, this rather imposing uh, 19th century school building. And the neighbor on the other side of this corner, a building by the Geneva architect, Marc Serge, which is a, a complex of um, a cinema and office use and um, some residential use. And what our building was um, quite intentionally uh, addressing was the need to reconcile these two different preceding architectures um, as a way of um, giving a, a basis for our own work. And very much with the memory of uh, that photograph that I also showed of another situation in Geneva. When we work with housing, the discipline of the plan is, is one that is central, but not everything. And when we look at the work of the wonderful uh, Basel architect, Roger Dina and his practice, Dina and Dina, 
we're always reminded of the incredible rigor and discipline, which is um, a quality and a character of this um, very impressive architect's output uh, from beginning to contemporary times. And in our work, um, the plan becomes an important form of investigation. Again, it connects to the points that I was making about type, but here a courtyard project, a courtyard building project that we worked on in Zurich, where we were looking at um, the organization of housing around a, um, a dis slightly distorted um, um, uh, a plot in, in the city of Zurich. And uh, a theme that I'll return to um, considers the issue of how the corners are organized. It must be said, uh, the external and the internal courtyards in this case. Or another plan study, uh, a project that we were involved in, um, in the east of Switzerland, where it must be said, we were looking very carefully at the wonderful architecture of the um, uh, Milanese masters, um, uh, people such as Asnaga Vender and Caccio de Minioni, and the incredible inventions that we identify in, in their, work, their built work from the 40s and 50s and 60s, particularly in Milan. And here in this um, uh, smallish housing project, we were looking at the sense of this, how this cluster of new housing could work together. Or this same project in North London that I showed you uh, from the outside, but where you can see that um, there is this um, extreme ambition to work with a theme of a constellation of rooms rooms bound by a rather loosely shaped perimeter, but where you pass from one room to, an, to another um, rather directly and the um, rather fanatical avoidance of the corridor as a device. So it results in a, in a, uh, a building where the rooms have their own particular geometry and you pass from the center of the plan to the perimeter as a um, series of carefully uh, orchestrated spaces. And a, a project that I will refer to uh, throughout this talk, um, uh, uh, a housing project that we finished uh, a year and a half ago in Zurich, which um, is also exploring some of these same issues about the avoidance of corridor and room as uh, one in the constellation of um, precisely proportioned spaces. Of course, the wonderful thing is not just to work in the plan, but eventually for the plans to become built and all of the lessons that um, that, that experience holds. And one of the things that's always really fantastic when a building is, is complete is to be able to really engage with the relationship that the, the spaces that you have conceptualized in a plan, how that they have then a real relationship to the city, which of course, depends on which floor uh, uh, we're talking about. And when I talk about our work in terms of um, working in London, the pressure to work with extremely tight space standards becomes one of, um, one of the great challenges. Um, here, uh, this same housing project in North London, which is uh, typically on one floor arranging uh, uh, four apartments of um, one or two bedroom. And this plan is, is uh, to demonstrate how uh, it's possible to organize furniture within these rather small spaces. And in our work, 
um, especially more recently, uh, we have looked at the question of um, elderly housing, where essentially you're planning very, very tight um, space standards and um, essentially one, one room, uh, a studio space. The 10th issue is connected to the previous one, but for us, the image and the representational character of housing is the thing that really deals with the um, form of urban responsibility that housing might have, the manner in which it deals with um, decorum as a, as a topic in architecture. And um, I use this image in a lecture uh, a few years ago, and someone after, after the lecture asked me, um, can we see this project by you? I didn't know of it, and I, I must say it's not by us. It's a, it's a reference to uh, two wonderful houses in Belgium. And if you hold your hand to the screen and look at one, um, independently to the other, your understanding of scale is completely confused when you look at the other one. It's a very interesting uh, set of circumstances. Well, this example of the significance of the facade, this house that's not very far from where I'm sitting today, um, a rather beautiful composition where it's clear that the placement of the door and the windows is uh, at the service of the rooms and the subtle shifts that occur, I find really wonderful. So when we're working on housing projects, there is constantly a question about the relationship that the image or the representational character of housing might have. And I would make the same insistence on the work of, of my students in Mendricio and here, the work of a former student several years ago. And a drawing that we made when we were working on the competition for this housing project in um, the double house that I referred to earlier, where the drawing is deliberately exploring this almost child -like, child's drawing of what a house might look like, or the arrangement of this end of terraced housing where the composition of the windows is subtly working with the convention, the older conventions of the London terraced house. Or here a project which is now under construction in Belgium, where we will, we're looking at um, the theme of uh, adjusted brick piers. Or another housing project that um, was finished a couple of years ago in Belgium for another large elderly housing project where we worked with a wonderful applied artist who made um, a, a collection of unique tiles which were introduced within the window assembly, uh, almost giving the impression of curtains that could be found behind the glass. Here, is, here are some images of the project. Uh, nearing completion. The eleventh theme is the space between, the sense in which the relationship between one building and another is at the core of the urban condition. And in the work again of Dina and Dina, this seems to be uh, a, a source of great fascination, the sense of proximity or adjacency. And when I speak of this housing project in North London, our critique of so much recent housing is that there feels often a, 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 a kind of fear of being able to um, build housing that is close by. And the parts of city that we enjoy the most are where there is this sense of neighborliness or even extreme proximity. <laughs> and when looking at um, uh, uh, a neighborhood of Zurich uh, built of um, uh, urban villas 
the space between becomes a key component in understanding the urbanizing character of this place. And in our work, this is explored inevitably through an exhaustive process of model making. And here in this project in, in Zurich, um, for me, a sort of rather crude definition of what the urban is, is at the moment where one house has to establish a relationship to another. And in this project, one of the, the key fascinations that we had was the sense of the charge of the space between the sense of proximity and the sorts of drawings that we made to begin to explore this as an interest. And the ultimate test of this consideration is the completed project and the significance that the silver birch tree you can see in this image plays within this uh, sense of the space between. In any moment that we're working on a project, there is inevitably a projection to the future. Um, it always slightly frustrates us that uh, developers or people that developers turn to to advise them think in rather conservative ways, because it's based on risk management and the sense of what is known. But for us, the question of what a future housing is, is a very open and um, important question. So if we are working on housing in the 1950s, the, um, the nuclear family as a prevailing condition would have been important. But what we like is, for example, this record of the residents of a tower block in the East End of London, and what it reveals to us is how complex this question of who lives in the spaces that you make. And also there is a certain fascination with the sense in which what the work of the architect is in relation to the making of home is a very precise set of decisions in terms of how high the wall, uh, the floor to ceiling is, the position of a door and a wall. But most of the atmosphere of these interiors is very much created by the residents and the things and the ideals that they hold. And we always find it very difficult to make such amazing images of interiors as the ones documented in that earlier series. Um, I think as architects, one um, always, uh, attempts to represent the atmosphere, but it is never exactly as it is proven to be the case, as this photograph by David Grandorge documents of the same housing project in Geneva in its inhabited state. And as architects, whenever we can, we always are happy to visit our projects inhabited, and even better many years after they've been completed, because they're full of lessons and inevitably rather full of surprises. The 13th theme, which I mentioned earlier, is the management of corners. When we think of our work in the city, we find so many wonderful examples of how this has been uh, fulfilled as a need through the work of others in the past. And this project by Kai Fisker, the uh, Danish architect, was completed when he was still in his nineteen uh, in his um, in his twenties, and um, the very powerful solution of this uh, corner column within this a very very big urban block seems like a very confident urban work. Returning to Geneva, in this case, we answered this question of how to make a corner by on the first three floors, employing these rather um, solid um, concrete piers. And on the upper floors, uh, making the 
um, the frame to opening a much more delicate one. And you'll see that on the upper corners, um, the, um, the column element is turned by 45 degrees. And to help us understand how to organize the corners of buildings, we often employ the unwrapped elevation as a tool to help us figure out how windows relate to a corner. And a project that in the Zurich office we're currently working on is for um, the making of this new urban block in a city in the east of Switzerland, which is very much um, an exploration of the theme of the corner. Or here in this project that I've already shown um, previously in North London. Or the way that we made these vertically aligned um, brick corners in this housing project in Zurich. And the pleasure that the finished building held, again, in relation to this tree, the sense in which the column supporting the, the lodges um, has a certain relationship to the trunk of the silver birch tree. And when we think about housing, we must always think about how the ground floor of any housing project is organized. And this um, uh, rather wonderful uh, street uh, in Basel, um, the sense in which in a street that has a busy tram line running through it, every space is, is occupied. And this for me gives an indication that um, something is working. And in the case of our, our project in, in Vienna, we, um, as I already mentioned, worked with two other studios. And the basis of, for our collaboration was a set of agreements about how these three buildings that each office would address um, would conform to a set of rules or guidelines that we agreed collectively from the outset. And one of them was to do with the idea of how the entrances would be from the inner shared space, not on the perimeter. And how working with the client, we were able to introduce a program of ground floor spaces, which include cafe, a cafe and a creche and other such um, more public functions. And this same housing project where the same question and consideration is given for the housing project in Zurich. And if one thinks about how the building comes down to the ground, it's also necessary to think about how the top of a housing building works and here in this Peabody housing project in London, this question is addressed through the work of Derbyshire, the author of this and a number of wonderful housing projects. And here in our work in North London, the decision to make these two different um, volumetric registers mm -hmm. is something of an answer to the question of how to deal with the top or in this housing project, there is very much uh, an idea about a, a lid that um, contains uh, this concrete and brick form. Or in the case of Geneva, we were happy that you would see the profile of the, the building against the sky. Or in the case of this project in Zurich, which has a very particular um, urban rule about um, an attic floor, which results in um, a stepping of volume on the top floor. And in our work in housing, we must always address the question of how do you come into a house? And this wonderful Robert Adam house in central London, interestingly, this porch is not placed symmetrically within the facade, but it is placed in the, in the center of the street, which the house lies at the end of. And in 
this housing project in, in Switzerland, we were looking at this question of how to indicate the, the as, a, as a, um, an element within the, the building vocabulary, the point of entry, or in the, the Viennese case where we make these rather grand entrance spaces in these um, three housing buildings. And a similar theme explored again in Zurich. In this case, a decision to compress the height of the portico element um, and the next space that you would enter has a, a, a much more generous space beyond it. And the way that um, circulation is organized in our work is also a point of great concern. The, the spaces that can be understood as semi-public spaces. In the case of a project in Geneva, um, the fascination with the open access staircase as a condition which has an older precedent in the city as we came to discover through studying um, Geneva over the years. And always the tension between being very efficient with circulation and recognizing as perhaps this photograph indicates the things that such spaces need to create a home for like a bicycle or the pots that people leave outside their door or the doormat. And drawings that begin to give precision to this as a possibility. The 18th theme is infrastructure. It's always a point of fascination for me what lies beneath the surfaces of the completed building. Here a drawing that shows the work of the electrical planner and the uh, incredible coordination of the things that one takes for granted in the, the completed project, the ability to switch on a light um, and that the wiring is well planned and, and coordinated. And we also have a fascination with this sense in which housing can be understood as a series of thresholds and territories. And here on a project I'll show in a moment um, a little bit more in detail. Or this earlier housing project that I showed earlier where um, with this extra floor of housing that we added to a former industrial building, there is this um, central corridor, which, because it was only on the top floor, we were able to make um, holes in the roof that bring background light to what would be otherwise um, an entirely enclosed space. And if you haven't guessed already, we rather like rooms. <laughs> we, we like the ability for a room to connect to another room and the management of such sequences and possibilities. And in our work, um, as was stated in the introduction, while housing is one of the, the, the main areas of our work, and in that work, there is always a sense of looking at the examples from the past and the sense in which housing makes city and how housing forms or can form a dignified background to the spaces of a city, here exemplified by Platz in Zurich. But the sense in which the city also needs to, any city needs to hold um, other kinds of amenity, and here a small park in London. And I certainly remember a wonderful park that I visited many times in Bucharest, which I wish I had a photograph to share with you. But in our work, we also um, feel it's necessary to work on other things, sometimes a house or a special program, uh, a tower house that we're working on in the south of England, or a building that forms a part of 
a campus, um, in this case in Shanghai, and the building that you see in the um, for, uh, as the main object in this photograph is uh, the welcome center to um, this campus that we built. And on the left hand side, a building by Dina and Dina, which uh, accompanies us. Or a project that we finished several years ago in, in a small city in, in Belgium, where we remodeled what was formerly a, um, a school building in this city and converted it into the new city library with the addition of two new wings. A library that hopefully feels like a library. Or the largest project that um, Sergis and Bates Architects were involved in this uh, collaboration with uh, NOAA Architects and from Brussels and EM2N in Zurich, where we're working on what was um, once a huge factory in Brussels for Citron and is now um, um, a project under construction to create um, a large art, art complex by the canal in um, the canal building, as it will be called. This is a huge work of reuse. And the last theme is to do with the relationship to construction. Very often in our work, one of the first uh, conversations we might have about a project is what something is made of. And this, of course, sounds rather obvious and even rather prosaic, but the sense in which the ideas that we can explore in our work might come out of um, a relationship to construction is something that, um, of course, is a, um, an evolving and an important consideration. And because many of our projects are situated in places in Europe where there is a strong brick culture, the possibilities of brick building are uh, a prevailing interest in our work. And this photograph that I still find really wonderful um, of uh, someone that doesn't look like they're the beholders of great skills. <laughs> and the sense in which we talk about the building industry in English, there is nothing that I really equate with the word industry, which suggests to me precision and accuracy and maybe even organization. And I think the acts of building is one that is always about the management of accuracy or inevitably the very um, complex conditions of a building site. Sorry. And the emergence of new ideas of architecture that came from the 1920s and 30s also offered possibilities of construction, which arguably have their origins in North American architecture and building. And in contemporary terms, um, while our early work was interested in the possibilities of timber-based construction, um, because of the scale and the economic circumstances of our work, often the default position is to use uh, in situ concrete as uh, the core building structure. And when building this building in Geneva that I've shown repeatedly, um, we found ourselves in a place where there was an amazing uh, precast concrete uh, uh, building um, tradition that we were able to, uh, to draw upon and utilize in our work. And so this project is made from a series of very, very uh, precisely uh, fabricated uh, panels with an outer uh, concrete face, the in insulation layer, and then the inner structure layer. And the accuracy that um, in Geneva it was possible to work with, I could never imagine having such, a, such an ambition if we were working, say, in, in London. And 
when we talk about materials, we must always remember that the last microns of thickness of a, a building material can give so much expression. In other words, what things are made of and the pigments and colors that we give to exteriors and interiors in our work. And so finally, I'll just show rather briefly um, this project in, in, in Zurich, which I feel like I've explained already rather extensively, but it's a, these two urban villas, which work with um, an interest in a form of brick construction, which it must be said in the context of Zurich, much of the city was built of brick at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Um, but um, in contemporary terms, it's not the, the dominant um, building material that would rather be render or in German puts. And these, are, these photographs are very, very recent. This is that same project that I showed earlier in Antwerp, the, um, the now completion of this um, urban block, which um, also incl includes um, the work of uh, two uh, uh, other offices in Belgium, including uh, Bovenbau. But the Part of this ensemble that uh, Sergis and Bates architects uh, ad addressed was this um, corner uh, um, apartment uh, building, which as you can see has a rather figured outer shape. And in Belgium, um, still a highly skilled uh, brick building industry. And you can see again these same interests with the layering and the relationship that the interior spaces might have to the city across this large body of, of water, uh, six towers, uh, two by Dina and Dina, two by David Chipperfield and two by uh, Tony Fretton. And finally, a project that was finished just a few weeks ago in London for this um, uh, tricky uh, urban site, um, an almost um, uh, invisible um, plot that our client developer um, had acquired. And the, the work here was to make um, a small residential development of nine apartments, which work on the basis of a sort of courtyard housing. And the completed project before it's inhabited um, show how within this uh, complex site, we're working hard to ensure that these apartments on two floors um, have a, um, a successful level of light and intimacy and privacy. And um, as I already referred to, the evolution of our own interests in um, brick forms of construction here working in London. Um, but I must say, when I look at the completed project, I feel like the extensive experience that we've had over the last 15 or so years of building in Belgium has resulted in a form of import back to uh, London. And to finish, for me, one of the most wonderful images of the European city, a photograph by the German artist and photographer, Thomas Strut. And this image of Rome in a sort of remarkably early sort of Sunday morning state where there is an absolute absence of people. In fact, the only indication of any form of uh, occupancy is the uh, little white Piet Panda, which is in the bottom middle of the image. But again, it reminds me of that same point that I was making in relation to the Geneva reference of how 
city is made by one act of building that is respectful and um, careful with the relationship it might have to the buildings that preceded it. It isn't about cancelling out the values that those older buildings might have. It's about being contemporary, but working with a sense of knowledge of what was reasonable and what has qualities from the past. Thank you. I'm very happy that in this lecture, I was able to see your faces because there's always this horrible moment when you give a lecture on Zoom where you feel like you're this person in a room just talking to yourself. So thank you for staying with me. We thank you for uh, the lecture and it was very, uh... It was a pleasure for us to, to listen and to uh, look at all the, the very seductive images you showed. Uh, I think that um, the, the themes you presented us as a way of, uh, um, of a, a background of your practice are in, have in fact a very uh, valuable, uh, very valuable importance for our students because they, uh, uh, target very important points uh, in thinking about housing in general, and uh, um, I was uh, I think that it was very uh, nice to uh, that you showed us everything from the urban scale to the um, to the detail and uh, um, very uh, delicate and precise elements that uh, um, you addressed in your projects. Uh, and also, I, I think that a very important idea is that we should always look at uh, historical precedents and uh, at uh, what pre precedes uh, the, the project, in fact, what exists before uh, we build on uh, a place, on a site. Uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for these ideas. Um, I will uh, ask if uh, there are questions. Um, from the colleagues that are in uh, in the Zoom meeting. I have uh, one. Please, uh, Mr. Sergison, uh, my name is Cosmin Kachu, uh, and I'm so glad to listen again a lecture from you, especially when uh, it is intended for a Romanian audience. I've been constantly looking for your uh, recent works, uh, as I find your project uh, as very good examples of architecture uh, for the city. My question is actually asking an advice from you. Uh, what book or books of theory of architecture would you mostly recommend to your students in this moment in order to understand more deeply the notion of architecture for the city, the relation between the architectural object and its urban place? Well, many thanks for that great question. Um, Every semester when I prepare the briefing document for my students, I always write a, a reading list. And I often feel that they, <laughs> they go over those pages rather quickly. It would only make me happy if they even took the books out of the library, uh, yet, let alone added them to their own library. Um, but one of the books that's a reoccurring um, uh, item on that list is um, The Architecture of the City by Aldo Rossi. Um, I find it a complex um, book to read. Perhaps it's, um, it is not without its um, uh, questionable areas, but I think what it, what it insists on is that the European city is something that we inherit and that it is organized morphologically and typologically and this should give us a clue as to what we might do. And I would also add to this answer that when Aldo Rossi was teaching at ETH in Zurich for only a very short period of time but very very influent, influential 
many of his students were given the task of making a survey of the old city of Zurich, which exists now as a beautiful drawing. And with the work that I've been doing with my students in Mendrisio this semester, we've set the same task as one of the exercises. Um, in this case, not working in Zurich, but um, in the Valley de Muggio where um, we're working this semester. So that is one. Another one that I would highly recommend is The Seduction of Place by Joseph Rickford, which um, I think is a fantastic read. And it is one of many uh, books by uh, Joseph Rickford that um, deal with um, the origins, but also the, the contemporary conditions of um, the European city. And in his work, there is a, um, a fascination with the, the Roman um, origin of many European cities. Um, uh, you know, uh, of course, looking at cities like uh, uh, Rome or Naples or, um, well, any number of uh, Roman cities. Um, I guess Bucharest, but um, <laughs> I should be careful. Um, that, those would be two that I would immediately recommend. I mean, I think Complexity and Contradiction is, is a book that we find ourselves discussing uh, time and time again. And uh, it's not exactly on urbanism, but um, Kenneth Frampton's um, a Critical History of Modern Architecture, I think, is, is, is a book. So those would be four that I would highly recommend to um, the students who are listening to this, this talk. Thank you very much for your answer. I, it is truly helpful for us. Thank you. Now, I was promised that the students were able to ask questions. And um, uh, does, uh, Melania, do you read the questions? How does it work? Yes, but <laughs> we don't have uh, for the moment questions on face, uh, on, uh, from the students. Uh, well, maybe we will wait. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if we wait a bit, uh, they will uh, engage us. <laughs> And maybe we can tell them to encourage them to ask because often they don't ask questions here in Romania. Yeah, it's they funny. Italian more. students aren't very good at asking questions as well. And I often wondered if it's because sort of emotionally they think, but if I ask a question, it suggests that something wasn't very clear in the lecture. I, anyway, that's, that's the excuse that I offer. <laughs> But we I have, like it when students ask questions. Yes. We, we, uh, we ask them to ask to put questions. Uh, we have 250 um, viewers on the Facebook now. So that it is uh, uh, quite a big audience, but uh, for the moment they are not, uh, not very <laughs> courageous, I think. Um, if there are some other questions here, maybe, Mihai? Uh, kindly, yeah, I would, I would uh, kindly ask you something, uh, Mr. Sergiusson. Um, it was uh, amazing, uh, indeed, your uh, lecture. Uh, I liked your work, but now I like it more. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, you are welcome. So, thinking about your very coherence of your work that uh, everybody of us uh, could observe uh, from, uh, from your presentation. I was thinking about uh, almost, that is almost impossible to have such an approach in uh, today Bucharest uh, because uh, we are facing a kind of a wild and unorganized development of the city. Um, under the pressure of real estate, especially and cheap, uh, cheap developments. Uh, so my question would be like uh, something like that. What advice would you offer to a young architect or to an architect to be as uh, our students are? Uh, to somebody who would uh, work here in this context, uh, especially that you said uh, you 
know a little bit our city. Mm -hmm. So in this context, what would your what what approach would you advise us to have? <laughs> That's a very difficult question to answer in a meaningful way because I could make really un, unreasonable kind of projections as to what what I I, I see as as a, the, the the difficulty that you all have to deal with. But I know that the reality is this extreme pressure that comes out of financial interests and um, the um, the parameters in which development is, is happening in Bucharest. And I know uh, in Bucharest, there are so many situations where really beautiful buildings from the past are being destroyed, not by earthquakes, but by, by um, uh, rather thoughtless um, development. And I know that in the city there are, you know, very conscientious, um, people working on the, the future planning of the city, but the reality is a bit like, um, it, it's very difficult to feel that you're in a position of, of influence or certainly um, uh, a, a feeling of powerlessness. I think, um, you know, collectively, what you have to, uh, <laughs> have to in, endeavor to do is to make more robust the competition system and the conditions in which projects are subjected to competition. I know that your School of Architecture is really a wonderful school and that the graduates that pass through the Yominko School are really um, very, very well-trained um, professionals. But I, I, I think it, it requires a form of collectivism in terms of solving the bigger problems. And that's where, you know, architects are not very good, but um, in the end, we have to make a living. And sometimes to things that we should say no to, we say yes, for reasons that are understandable. But I think you should be more opinionated and more outspoken and, <laughs> Um, I know all that I'm saying is easy for me sitting here to say, um, and part of the reason that I find myself um, working more in, in Central Europe is a similar set of frustrations that I, I have with London, where um, what I've seen happen in London in the last 20 years is really heartbreaking. But there are neighborhoods that I've known all my life that I feel have been frankly destroyed through thoughtless um, development. So, you know, what I would say is that the European city is something that we inherit and it is the most precious form of patrimony. So um, it, it, what happens to some extent happens on our watch as contemporary architects, but we, we have to do whatever we can to um, always bring all the ambition that should be projected onto a project. And I know what I'm saying is, is um, could be accused of being idealistic. Um, it's not naive, I hope, because it's, I, I, I know the situation in which you're working. But, you know, for me, what, what you could take, a, we could always take heart from is this wonderful statement by Roger Dina, where he said, in a, uh, um, he said once that a place can be brought to order through the building of just one house. And I like the optimism that that gives, that just one good building might have the ability to, in some way, make a place better than all of the bad things that lie around it. So that would be my answer. Yeah, thank you very much. It's uh, quite uh, wise and not idealistic. I think it's realistic what you said. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. There are uh, other questions. I I have uh, I don't know questions or something. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very much for uh, for your very inspiring. Uh, uh, 
conference uh, about the competition. You say something about the competition. Uh, I want to tell you that the order of architects is fighting a lot mm -hmm. uh, to have competition uh, com competitions. Uh, in our uh, uh, culture, it's um, it's a real fight to mm -hmm. to make a competition with administration or with the private uh, sector. Uh, I know in uh, Switzerland, uh, it's a common, uh, it's a habit to make competitions. Uh, it's a culture. Mm -hmm. uh, even our colleagues uh, uh, participate in the competition in Switzerland. <laughs> Uh, and uh, ju just to, to have a more optimistic view of life. Um, but uh, what I want to, uh, to, uh, to say, uh, you said something about the industry and I like very, very much you said the industry, it's a uh, management of uh, accuracy. I, 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 it's, it's very nice. Uh, it's very nice that. Um, about our public architects, which who is working now, um, it's a project management culture. So uh, in Romania, we're facing this culture very powerful, very, uh, very clear. And I want uh, to ask you, how do you do you manage uh, this uh, situation between architecture and like uh, uh, an act of culture? And uh, project management, like an act of uh, maximum pragmatism. How do you make housing between these two wor worlds? How they work uh, in your work and in Switzerland and even in London? Well, over the years, we've had the opportunity to build in a number of countries and in each case there's a need to to learn about the local building culture it's not a, an immediately transferable knowledge that we have so in our work in say Germany or Austria or France or certainly in Belgium there has been a need to sort of assimilate because not to do that inevitably leads to disappointment that, um, you know, through trying to figure out what the particularities of one building culture are in relation to your own primary experience, in our case from London, um, this is a, a very necessary step. And it, it also, um, I mean, the reality is that we are um, fantastically stubborn I guess, um, <laughs> and always optimistic. And um, the early projects that we achieved that now seem almost miraculous were through an intense investment in uh, asking what, at that moment, a contemporary architecture could be in London. And it must be said at that point, there was this incredible force of project managers taking over all, all of the influence of, um, of, uh, of the building process. In other words, the architect was um, really being sidelined and that, that hasn't been reversed by the way um, uh, in time. Um, the other thing that I would say is that the competition system in the UK at that point was nearly non-existent. So we had um, only the opportunity to work on a number of, um, of competitions and miraculously we were lucky with um, one or two of them. And just through that luck, you just need one bit of luck then suddenly you become an authority on housing just by building one. And so that then led to being invited to do things where, um, unlike our colleagues, we were seen to have some kind of experience. I, I would say to any younger architect listening that you just always have to find the opportunity. Um, Tony Fretton, a, a wonderful London architect, said to me when I was young that, everything's an opportunity. You just need to um, see where the better opportunities are. Um, but I do observe, Emil, that in 
The case of Switzerland and certainly in Belgium, they are two exceptionally interesting architectural cultures at the moment. And both of them have a very, very well-grounded competition system. So in the case of Belgium, although I'm really speaking about Flanders, not Belgium per se, the Flemish Baumeister, who is, um, um, the, the competition system uh, for public uh, building has to come through uh, the office of the Baumeister. And in Switzerland, I, I think the, there is this um, amazing sort of uh, condition of, um, of democracy that is unique um, in my experience. And so the discussion of a competition sort of in a way is completely aligned with a, a bigger sort of national um, mentality that um, things should come through an openness to always achieve collectively the best, the best result. And I think that's what's so, so impressive about um, the competition system when it's well organized. Yes, that's true. Uh, and another question, I don't know if, yeah, again, a question. It's about pandemics. Um, you know, in uh, Bucharest, and I, I, I think in all great cities and not great cities, a lot of offices now uh, are turning in housing. Do you have this kind of project? Do you know this, this kind of uh, attitude in Switzerland or you, you work on, this kind of project? Sorry, I, I'm not sure I completely uh, follow. Yes, yes. Uh, a lot after pandemics, a yeah. lot of uh, building for offices are transformed in housing buildings. Uh, and uh, I want to ask you in uh, Switzerland, is uh, the same uh, attitude after pandemics or in England or you? Do you have some kind of project? Um, in Switzerland, less so. Um, I mean, I must say, frankly, the, the pandemic hasn't been as uh, big an impact on everyday life as it, it has in, in, in many other European um, countries. But in London, this is a very, very big question because um, there is an enormous amount of office space and what people are, of course, reflecting on is very much the question you ask, you know, do we need every day to travel these great distances that we, we are traveling to get to a place of work? Haven't we learned that there are other possibilities? I mean, I think to many, um, the, the social or the sort of group dynamic that comes out of working collectively isn't in question, but I, I think there is also um, a certain flexibility about how we could work in the future and certainly in relation to travel. So in London, where there are so many millions of square meters of, of empty office space at the moment, I, I, it is already a, a, a very um, big, discussion how um, commercial office space um, will need to be reduced and where in the city there is always a shortage of housing this could uh, could fulfill another program and then of course as architects we have to say yeah but it should be done qualitatively it's not just about making really deep plan office spaces very bad housing which unfortunately um, certain people would, would, would enact without uh, hesitating. Okay, thank you very much and uh, hope to see you again. <laughs> yeah, thanks Emil. I was about to ask a question, but uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, questions uh, start to, uh, to arrive from the Facebook audience. So I will read um, a very interesting question, which, uh, relates to your uh, uh, creative processes. I think it's by Christina Dudan. Your work has a certain sense, I quote, your work has a certain sense of timelessness and seems to have deep roots, deep roots in the history of architecture. Where do you draw your sense of order, tectonics and tactility from? 
Well, that's a wonderful question and quite a big question. Um, I mean, firstly, I, I would say in relation to that question, um, we've always been interested in, in, in making an architecture which isn't, um, which is striving to be timeless. That I, I think the, um, of, of course, there are always these conditions or forces that are about the contemporary, but somehow it would be frustrating if um, you would look at our work and sort of be able to place it so precisely in terms of an architectural moment or a discourse that it would be in our minds um, uh, a success if, if our buildings have a, a, a enormous timelessness. I, I know that that's really, really hard to achieve, but, but we must surely look, for example, at the architecture that was being built when I was a student in the 1980s and this fascination with postmodernism and you know, a building from the 1980s, there's no mistaking when it was built. And you know, another aspect of an answer to that question, which I find sort of multi-layered is our work is always about a relationship to place. It's not in opposition to the place, it's um, always consciously drawing upon the unique circumstances of any place. Um, and there are, as you might have seen in our projects in this, in this lecture, um, sometimes more explicit relationships that a project has and, and sometimes more implicit ones. But for me, um, a project always starts with a visit to the place in which we find ourselves working. That, that is um, uh, full of um, clues as to how we might meaningfully um, uh, work and, and, and react. And um, there are very, very few moments where it hasn't been possible at the beginning of a project to, to go to a site and absorb all of the myriad pieces of information that a site holds. I mean, in, in the case of the project in Geneva that I referred to, the, the clue was this, this sort of question of reconciling um, the, the buildings that, um, our, our building now has as neighbors. But in, in every project, there is a version of the same kind of um, fascination. Thank you. Um, I will read uh, because we have uh, some other questions. Uh, it's uh, one from our colleague, Andra Panait. Uh, she asks, uh, can you tell us a little about your teaching experience? How do you see guidance as a teacher, as a mentorship, or as trying to help students discover their own way of thinking? Well, my relationship to teaching is, is a long-standing one. Um, I frankly started teaching maybe when I was too young, but I, I, my first teaching position was with a really experienced teacher, Mika Bandini in North London. And I was um, uh, in that first year taught how to teach, which um, is a, um, a lesson that I, I am forever grateful to Mika for. And, Certainly Stephen Bates and I have always operated with essentially three forms of practice. The first is our practice, which is committed to building. The second is our practice as teachers. And the third, which mediates between these two is a practice of writing, which we have always um, found necessary and also very, very difficult as a discipline. And I think um, in my role as a 
as a teacher, um, I have a responsibility to pass on knowledge that I've acquired over the years, particularly the experience of, of building. Um, I see my role as a mentor. Um, I think mentorship is, is really uh, at the core of the work, not only as a teacher, but often in practice with younger collaborators. Um, but in the end, the thing that motivates me greatly as a teacher is where students are bringing things to my attention that are not so much uninteresting to me, but beyond my own experience or my own, uh, the things that we might be working with in our own practice. And I, um, that makes life very, very interesting. Um, I've noticed over the years, at any moments where I haven't been teaching, I'm convinced I'm a less um, fluent designer. But I think, you know, the reason that I, I teach in Switzerland is because the, the, um, the insistence of the schools in Switzerland is that the people who teach design are really established and committed practitioners, um, firstly and foremostly. Um, in the UK, I think that's more and more difficult. And I think in North America, it just doesn't exist as a, as a condition. And I think architecture suffers from this. So um, that's not to say that people who teach, say, history and theory uh, are really academics and, and their contribution I value greatly. But I think that a, a, a studio teacher um, if they have the daily experience of addressing the questions that they might be asking through the assignments they give their students, I think this is, this is relevant. So, Ander, thank you for your question. Okay. Um, I hope I answered it. Thank you. Oh, there you I, are. <laughs> I, I, would, I would like to ask you something. Uh, my name is Anka Otsoyu. Um, you told us at the beginning about uh, the way you um, ab about the process of teaching during six uh, semesters with your uh, <laughs> students. Uh, I could you explain us a little bit more about uh, what is it about? Is it about urbanism uh, in this uh, semesters and then? uh relating uh, this urbanism with uh, uh let's say some uh, kind of design of programs of places of uh, uh mm -hmm. well different things but yeah. what what is it about about tell us please about... The, the, the the core question that i was asking the students was to create a, a a concept, an urban concept, for how Zurich could be in 2040 with a need to accommodate 100,000 people in addition to the population of the city. And so what we found ourselves doing with the students was looking at every square meter of the city and finding where the opportunities were to create essentially densification, where where it would be reasonable and urbanistically and architecturally relevant to create um, additional housing for uh, the growing population of the city. So I would say that the, the work is, is both an urban and an architectural question. But in our work, I'm always interested in this relationship between strategy and detail. I think you can't make um, a meaningful urbanism um, by ignoring one in relation to the other. So at the beginning of each semester, the students worked in groups and worked on questions in relation to um, developing a, a movement strategy. In other words, how um, uh, public transport, vehicular, bicycle, pedestrian movement could be um, reorganized in the area and the city we were working with. Um, another strategy looked at uh, the relationship of conservation to understand what buildings are protected and so that there is a, 
uh, a sense of um, you can't just erase whole neighborhoods, that there is this uh, heritage issue that needs to be addressed. Um, other groups of students looked at questions of public realm, where it would be necessary to create parks or uh, public spaces. Um, other groups of students looked at um, the strategy of housing, which of course is a, a big one. Other groups of students looked at questions of um, uh, employment uses in the future in the city. And finally, students were also looking at um, uh, non-normative programs. So where it would be necessary to build additional schools or medical facilities and, and, and so on and so forth. So it was, um, well, it carries on as a project, but uh, as, a, um, uh, with, as, a, as a form of um, more <coughs> precisely structured research. But the work that my students were doing um, started with this um, strategic study, and that shifted then to um, finding where the argument could be made for precise projects and to the, and uh, either working in pairs or individually, the students developed uh, concrete proposals for these places. So what we wanted to avoid was a, um, a contribution to the city that remained really just as diagrams, but we felt that it was necessary to give an image to how the city might be transformed. And there's a, a, an image that one of my assistants helped me make, which she, she took an aerial photograph, uh, sorry, a, a photograph from above Zurich looking over the city and took the students' work and um, through Photoshop introduced it into the city. And the point that I'm making is that the sum of this work, which results in a, in a substantial increase in the population, doesn't very evidently change the existing image of the city. It is transforming it, but it's not canceling it out. And for me, that's an important point um, uh, behind our work, that what makes Zurich special now is intact when we um, would have finished uh, our, our work in the future. Of course, in the end, it's an academic work, but it, it was done very much in collaboration with um, all of the agencies who work for the city of Zurich in, in many departments. And I suppose the last thing I would just say is that for me always, I, as a teacher, I, I try and set um, projects that are real, that they are real, real questions. They're not um, uh, uh, entirely speculative. Uh, so at the moment, with uh, this semester, because of the COVID situation, we're working on a, uh, on a, a question that's very, very close to um, the academia in Mendrisio and the villages that lie um, immediately above Mendrisio. Thank you for your question. I hope I adequately answered it. Yes, thank you very much. I think it's a good way of, uh let's say, a pro letting the, the students approach to places to uh, and to include this uh, uh, development uh, strategy, which I think uh, uh, can make them understand a lot of things without, uh, um, let's say, uh, without uh, um, dealing with uh, um, strictly urbanistically graphics, as, yeah. you, as you said. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anka. Uh, I also have... Uh, yes, please, Vladimir. I have a question at the other end of the uh, um, spectrum of uh, urban and architectural uh, uh, things. Uh, it's fascinating um, uh, brickwork in your uh, projects. Uh, could you please comment a little bit on the relation between uh, material construction and decoration? Yes. Um, my education was 
primarily a modernist one. So I had as a student this um, teaching that was in relation to the emergence of international modernism. And I've been trying to make sense of that for a long time, but um, one thing that modernism purged was the possibility of a decorative architecture, that that was um, something superfluous. And I think with more experience and perhaps more confidence, we feel freer to be um, using the materials that particularly brickwork, say, in our construction, that um, is more playful, that, um, that we know now how we can modify the surface of a brick wall through not just laying the bricks in the most expedient way, but by creating um, surfaces that can catch a light or give um, a certain um, animation to the surface of a facade. And I don't see this as decorative as much as um, exploring uh, construction to give differing effects to the atmosphere and, and the, um, the experience of a building. And I'm trying to be very precise in answering your question because I think it's a very, very good one, but it's, be, it, it's also, um, because I see the work of some of the, my colleagues and perhaps even a slightly younger generation of architects, which I, I find interestingly, even re-exploring postmodernism, which I sort of also grew up with as a student. And um, I still couldn't imagine just applying decorative elements in the, in the making of a facade or even an interior. I think that would have to be the work of someone else. Thank, thank you. Not thank at you. all. There is also, if, you, if, you, uh, if it's possible, um, an interesting question posed by uh, uh, on Facebook. Uh, can I read it? Yes. Which uh, relates to the question of representation. It's by uh, Andra, Andra Ioana Stai. The, I, I quote now, the extremely balanced architectural aesthetics of your projects, as well as the atmosphere of the completed buildings, makes me wonder to what extent the atmosphere of the renderings or concept images helps in the process of creating them. Their atmosphere is often extremely bohemian. I don't know if this is the term, also, the final projects give an extremely contemporary image and well anchored in reality. Is the overall concept atmosphere important in order to start the projects and explain them to the future users of the space? Mm. I think the relationship to atmosphere is an important one, and I've touched on it to some extent already, but, um, you know, in, in very early on when we're developing a project, the, the commitment to uh, a, a construction technique is, is something that we will, we will um, address. You know, um, it depends where we're working, that, that, that conversation. Um, but it helps inform a lot of other decisions because the atmosphere of a project is always related to how it's built. And what I would really emphasize in the way that we develop architecture is that, of course, we're always making drawings. Um, I must say, I can only draw by hand to this day. I've never learned to draw on a computer. So that sort of ages me a bit. It also makes me completely unemployable as a young, if I was a young architect. <laughs> but um, but the, the, one of the key activities still and always is model making, that we are constantly exploring projects through um, a plastic exploration. 
and that's at every scale. So, of course, it creates a certain um, problem in terms of keeping order in our studio because every now and then we have to <laughs> rather tragically throw things away. But um, the making of models for me is still the most reliable way of developing architecture because a model allows you to assess a form in a way that a, a drawing doesn't, that you can see the mistakes much more quickly. And that also means making models of interiors. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is that the drawings that are being referred to are necessary, but to some extent made with a bit of reluctance because um, those renderings are necessary, um, certainly when, when we make a competition, you know, that there is an expectation that there is a um, two-dimensional representation of a project, but we know that they are loaded with risk because when you see something, you react to it in a very emotive way. And if we could ever avoid making those images, we sort of would. Um, we, we, I think, have found our own way of dealing with it, and it's an evolving story. But I, I particularly have a, an indifference to super sort of photorealistic images, because um, <laughs> at that point, you might as well not need to build the building. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, uh, because, yeah, there aren't many surprises left with those images. So I, I have a bit of a, um, yes, I, I would say uh, difficulty with uh, uh, visualizations, but, um, and I also think they're a bit of an elephant trap sometimes, but um, I know that we've lost competitions because someone has immediately disliked that image and, um, and then you're sunk. It's, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's, yeah, uh, I, it, it's an evolving issue for me, but where I, I'm always happier is, is way, when we have a chance to um, show our work through, through plastic means. And anecdotally, I think we've won more competitions by being able to bring a model into a room than when uh, a drawing is on a wall. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, you are, uh, if you agree, I will uh, read the one last uh, question we have uh, from the students in the chat. Um, a question from Valentina Popa. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to ask what is the first stage of each project you are carrying out? After knowing the history of the place, the community and the urban elements that make up a site, which is the first stage, the first, first elements that lay the foundation of the project? Mm. Well, I mean, I think in, in that very nice question, um, there's an, there's an accuracy about uh, the need to try and make sense of the place that I referred to earlier. But then there's something that happens and it's always uh, exciting and, and um, yeah, the most wonderful aspect of architecture, which is where that first, <laughs> that first idea is committed to paper or the first rudimentary model is made. The, the attempt to find an idea. And beyond that, it's, it's a discussion. Um, I have two partners. We have many, many collaborators these days, but I began practicing with Stephen and the first discussions were always across a table and they are now uh, more complex than layered. But um, yeah, the first thing is the 
ability to articulate um, an idea and from there begins a wondrous uh, journey of making a project and um, you are never um, I don't think any architect has so many forms or um, so many ideas so there is I think you could recognize certain fascinations that are held in our work. And I think also the need to articulate a position as architects. Um, but there is also this sort of um, restlessness to always try out new things. And, and I would just finish by saying that in that statement, there is also the acceptance that we never invent anything. But the necessity to look at history reminds us that everything has been done in some way before, be it in high architecture or in ordinary acts of building. And for us, there is a huge inspiration that comes from looking um, at the conditions of the European city and the conditions of um, the environment that we encounter um, through the possibilities of, of travel. And if any of you um, would look at my photographs on Instagram, <laughs> they are in a way a testimony to this fascination with how things are made by the acts of people over the centuries. And I am learning constantly from what, what I encounter in the world. And I would encourage you all to do the same. And perhaps to accept that originality is not the first motivation that should exist in um, an architect's uh, um, mind, but rather to, to learn and to adjust um, things that already have been done. Thank you. Uh, only if it's possible to read a uh, last one. Okay, I, I could answer one more, but then I might collapse. Okay, it's an interesting one, um, which, uh, uh, which turned us back to the question of housing and dwelling yeah. by Theodor Brat. You talked about that project with two buildings connected that had a maze of rooms. How do you motivate the lack of sunlight for the center rooms? even if those are only for services, like circulation, deposit rooms, bus, I teach here that every loom, room, despite of its function, needs a bit of natural light. Is that maze created just to catch your eye with a certain design? And please allow me to add a layer to this question and to put it in a historical perspective. I think this plan, which is quite famous in contemporary architectural culture, is um, Please comment a little bit on its uh, potential to um, uh, be like a quintessence of uh, the way you look at history and the way you look at reinventing um, uh, dwelling modes, uh, which can be very new and in the same time rooted in uh, the I, you know, apartment history. Thank you. I mean, it's a, it, 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 it's an understandable question. I mean, for me, the answer that I would give is in relation to a functional argument that I remember reading something by Louis Barragan, where he said, the trouble is with contemporary housing is that we're, af we're afraid of shadows, that to retreat from sunlight can also be a quality. I mean, I can imagine in Bucharest on a really hot summer's day, but to be in a room that is not on the, on the street, but deeper into a plan brings certain advantages. And I, I would just, as a, as a statement on, on the question say, I think it's okay that not every room is 
equally well lit. I think it brings a quality to housing, but there can be choices that a plan could offer. So it's definitely not a functional argument. It's more about an emotional um, possibility in terms of how we might live. Because it, if it's not that, then every apartment building can't be more than 12 meters from facade to facade. And I, I, would, um, I would say that that's um, not so interesting. Of course, the plan is um, fascinated with certain relationships to architectural culture, as I freely would acknowledge, we have looked long and hard at the amazing plans of an architect like Caccio Dominioni for inspiration or the work of uh, Antonio Cadurc from, um, um, uh, from Spain. But I, 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 I think if you say that every room has to be um, evenly naturally lit, I find that really a, a, a boring um, possibility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture and for being so pa patient and answering all our questions that were so many. Uh, and uh, thank you again for uh, offering us uh, this evening that was uh, very interesting. <laughs> and we hope that uh, maybe in the future we uh, are uh, lucky to, to have you uh, here in Bucharest for a conference if uh, it will be possible. That would be a great pleasure. And I thank you all for uh, following. It's been a long session. I, it's quite uh, impressive that there has been so much um, uh, interaction and, and, and wonderful questions. I, for that, I really, really thank you all for your engagement. Um, I hope to see you in Bucharest soon. Thank you. Okay. And uh, goodbye to everybody. <laughs> okay, goodbye. 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 Bye bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good evening. <laughs>